star-shaped fort at the bottom at the south end of Antwerp. And I was looking at that star-shaped fort, and it looked very similar to the Castillo San Marcos in, in um, Florida, where I used to live. And it's the, you know, in St. Augustine, the oldest city in America that has its history, goes all the way back to the 1500s. And so it was built about the time that this map was made. And I was looking at that castle, and I thought, man, do you think the 16th century uh, citizens of Antwerp, do you think that they knew what was going on in America at the time? And then I started thinking about what was happening since, like what's happened since that map was made. And, and just trying to explain to a 16th century Belgic mind what it would be like to live today, uh, that you could fly from America to Antwerp in a matter of hours. That one sentence has so many conundrums it would have been impossible for them to make sense of. What do you mean flying? <laughs> what's America? <laughs> And I mean, just think of all that we know and all, the, all that's happened since then. Uh, the fact that I could even find the print of that map on my smartphone. What's a smartphone? What's a phone? <laughs> uh, I mean, just every, like, like looking at what's happened in 500 years, what's changed in 500 years would be absolutely impossible for the 16th century mindset to be able to have a category for what's just common to our everyday experience. And sometimes it might seem like knowing and even doing God's will can seem about as impossible as knowing what the world might look like 500 years from now. I remember talking to a friend about a decision that they'd made in their life, and uh, the question was, why did you do such and such? And they said, well, because I, I know it was God's will. I said, well, how did you know it was God's will? And they said, because I prayed about it. And it was just interesting as we talked about that, um, what it ended up, what that ended up being. I mean, this was just basically, there's something I was thinking, something that was kind of attractive to me, so I prayed about it, and then I did it. And I know it was God's will because I prayed about it. And in that kind of equation, or in that kind of practice, the prayer kind of became almost a token, like a talisman, like a, like a proof, just kind of a, a justifying, almost vindicating this desire that then suddenly became God's will because we prayed about it. And obviously, if we did that, we could, we could virtually justify about any selfish desire we have and call it God's will because we could just say, well, I prayed about it. Um, that's obviously not how it goes with knowing God's will. If we want to know the heart and the will of our God, um, if we just imagine that it's whatever impulse rests in our heart after we have offered up a prayer to the Lord, then that really kind of becomes, it kind of turns prayer into a... Um, a Gideon's fleece. It kind of becomes just a test and a trial and just to see if this is, gonna, if this is going to work. Um, 1 Corinthians 2 says we can't know the, the heart and the mind and, the, and by, by implication the will of our God apart from the Holy Spirit making it known. If we want to know God's will, what he wants for us, he needs to tell us. And uh, of course, prayer has an important part to play in that, but prayer isn't some sort of mystical experience where God just impresses us with some sort of sensation that then suddenly becomes God's will because it happened while we happened to be praying. We need to know God's will from his word. The only way we can know what God wants is because he would have to tell us that that's what he wants. Let me give you a couple of examples. This becomes very clear in scripture. I'm going to use two that are very close together. Look at 1 Thessalonians for a second. One in chapter 4 and one in chapter 5. And here's two very simple statements of God's will. And you can know this because God tells us. If, if, you want, if you're asking the question, what is God's will? Well, look no further than, for instance, a text like 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, your holiness. Sanctification is your being set apart and distinct and made holy. It's your being a set apart from everything that's common and sinful. It's being like God in your practical walk. He spells it out in three ways. Verse 3, 4, and um, 6 explain the three ways, that you, uh, three descriptions or explanations, really, of what this sanctification is. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, 
because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. It becomes very clear in this text. We don't have to look any farther. What what does God want for us? What's his will? What's his desire for us? It's our holiness. And spells it out in three specific ways. That is absolutely what God wants for all of us. Another example is in the next chapter, chapter 5. Look at verse 18. Chapter 5, verse 18, Paul writes this, In everything give thanks, because this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. I mean, it couldn't be more simple. Here's a, state, a statement straight from God's lips. If you want to know what God wants for you, he says, here's my, here's my want for you. What do I want for you? I want you to give thanks in everything. In everything. In all circumstance. It doesn't matter what circumstance I've placed you, God says. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. It doesn't matter the difficulty you're in. It doesn't matter how the, the joy, the, what your emotional state is. It doesn't matter the resources you may or may not have. What matters is you're in a circumstance, a set of circumstances, and my will for you is that you would give thanks in those circumstances that I've given you. This is what God wants for us. It's his will. It's his desire for us. It's his and if we maybe use a little bit more of a human word, it's his wish. <laughs> of course, God doesn't have wishes like, you know, like I wish upon a star. <laughs> God's not wishing upon a star like I hope something, you know. But this is a sense where this is his moral will. It's his desire for us even, even if we did disobey. And so this is God's will. It's actually, in many instances, theologically, we realize it's actually distinct from his sovereign plan in a certain way. God sovereignly determines all that has occurred. There's nothing that could possibly occur outside of God's sovereign foreordination. And his plan and his purpose by which he governs the universe is singular and perfect, and it includes all sorts of things outside of his will in this sense, his desire for us, including things like the murder of his own son and the perversion of justice that got him to, to be indicted. So, so here you, 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 we start to see that when we see on the page of Scripture God's will for us, we're talking about his desire for us. This is not necessarily his, what he's determined, because obviously any one of us sin, and we could look back at that sin, and, and we could say, well, is that God's will? Well, is, is, is God sovereignly overseeing all that happens? Yes. Is that his desire for me? No. And so we've got to be really careful about how we use that word will. Um, but there's two different words, actually, in the, in the original Greek. And this is the word for his desire. The other one is the word for his counsel, his purpose, his foreordination. It's, like, it's what he's determined to, to happen, more in a providential sense. This word is more used as, maybe if you've read some theology, more in the sense of his moral will. So one might be his decreed will, what actually happens, or his moral will, what he wants for us. And so we're talking about, man, we, we need to seek to know God's moral will. We are not asked to know God's sovereign will. What's God going to do tomorrow? <laughs> None of us could know, and we're not supposed to know. If, he, if we were supposed to know what happens tomorrow, he would have told us. Now you say, okay, well, Christ comes back. Well, that's not his secret will. And if it happens tomorrow, those who, his children are ready. <laughs> we're like, great, <laughs> he's coming back tomorrow. That's awesome. He told us that, and we're banking on that. But specifically, what do I know is going to occur in the next 24-hour period? I don't know, and you don't know, unless, it's said, unless God told us in his word. And so we don't need to know. We need to know his will, his wish for us, his desire for us not what he's determined, not the secrecies of his providence that he hasn't told anyone. He's not obligated to tell anyone those things. So we're not looking for some sort of thing that's mystical or unknown or it's different from one person to another person. We are looking at what does God want for his children? What does he want from us? What is God's will in the sense of his moral will? Well, let's look at Colossians chapter 1, because this becomes such a helpful prayer, and, and um, this is a prayer that, uh, honestly, I, I memorized it many, many, many years ago, and I was trying to make my way through it, 
uh, about a week ago, and I realized I have long since lost it, so I rememorized it. Uh, I'm not going to try to show that off this morning, so I'll probably make a fool out of myself and prove myself wrong, but at least it was memorized <laughs> a, few, a couple, few days ago. And it's just been ministering to me in such a profound way, I want to just spend our equipping hour in this prayer. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12, is Paul's prayer for the Colossians to know God's will. I want to read this prayer, and then we're going to work through it. It's, a, it's just a profound prayer, and we need to make it ours this morning. As I mentioned, I hope to close with this prayer as our closing prayer. Verse 9, Paul says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. This is an incredible prayer, and as you see in verse 9, he's praying, and he says, I haven't even ceased, to, I haven't stopped praying for you since the day he first heard of their response to the gospel, and the, the, the fact that they are actually, uh, I guess, you know, Epaphras from verse 7 has told them, um, <laughs> has told Paul, look, they're, they're responding to the, to the word, it's bearing fruit, as he says in verse 6. It's bearing fruit. It's increasing among the Colossian believers. Since he heard about it, he hasn't stopped praying for the Colossians, specifically that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. This isn't a prayer, like I said, to know something that's unknowable, like just give them a knowledge of your will because, you know, in some sort of mystical fashion, some sort of secret mindset of God that he's never revealed on the pages of Scripture. We can't know God's will apart from his word. And so what purpose does prayer possibly serve with regard to the will of God? That's kind of the question that came to my mind as I was thinking about that, like just to dispel the myth that if I'm lacking knowledge of God's will, I just pray and then I mystically, by God's supernatural power, am infused with something that is not in the Bible. That would be something more like revelation. And that's not what Paul's even praying here. In fact, let me just to kind of jump the gun a little bit. Let me jump down to a, a, a couple words in verse 10 and show you a parallel here before we get going. In verse 10, notice, after he says to please him in all respects, he starts to spell out what that's going to look like when this happens in someone's life. It produces some things. Namely, number one, bearing fruit in every good work. And number two, increasing in the knowledge of his will. I'm sorry, in the knowledge of God. So there's bearing fruit and increasing. And in, in the original, those two words, bearing fruit and increasing, are just right next to each other, back to back, mimicking virtually the exact same phrase that he said back in verse 6. So to get to verse 6, we really have to start in verse 5, because in verse 5 he's talking about the word of truth, which is the gospel. And so in verse 6, when he starts with that word which, that relative pronoun's pointing back to the word of truth, the gospel. So I'm going to go ahead and start with verse 6. I'm just going to substitute in the word of truth, the gospel, has come to you just as in all the world also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. Same two words, same two participles, back to back. And it's ascribed to the word of God, the gospel, the truth. The scripture itself is bearing fruit and increasing. And in fact, the only thing that's different about these two words in verse 6 and the two words in verse 9 is, and this is really to nerd out on you for a second, but this is so good because it's God's word and it's worthy of all attention. In verse 6, he uses a voice, and we, uh, voice is hard to talk about in English, but basically just think of active and passive, right? Active voice, so we'll put up our, push our grammar, our grammar glasses up on our nose here, and let me just give you a little grammar lesson. So active voice uh, you do something, passive voice, something's done to you, okay? So I hit the ball, I was hit by the ball, 
I hit the ball, I'm active. I was hit by the ball, I'm passive, right? So Greek has a, has a third voice. It's called the middle voice. And so, I mean, you could say, like, I was hitting myself, and that would be kind of an, that'd be one example of a middle voice, but that's not the only thing that the middle voice does in, in Greek. It, it actually can be used to kind of emphasize that the subject is doing something for its own advantage, so it actually is doing an action that it benefits from. And that's what's happening here. This is profound. Paul actually uses the middle voice in verse 6 of the word bearing fruit because the scripture is the subject. The scripture is actually producing this fruit on its own accord for its own gain or advantage or benefit, and it's a really powerful construction. Then when he switches down in verse 9, I'm sorry, in verse 10, excuse me, bearing fruit and increasing, the word increasing is the same, but the word bearing fruit there is just a simple active because the subject now is the Colossians. He wants the Colossians to bear fruit. So that, of course, they need to be active. They're actively involved in the bearing of fruit. But unique from the word of God, which bears fruit on its own accord, scripture, uh, the Colossians are different than the scriptures because they're bearing fruit actively, but not in the middle sense, on their own accord in some sort of independent fashion like the scriptures do. That's profound. The reason, why do I say all that? Because we're in, diving into this prayer that I don't want anyone to be confused. It's not as though, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm lacking objective knowledge of God's will, and I need some information. The scriptures aren't sufficient for that information. And so let's, let's pray that God would zap me some, with some additional information. That's not what's happening here. But we are dependent on the Lord in prayer for the answer to this request. This request is not a static knowledge of something objective that you could only learn from 1 Thessalonians 4.3 or from 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Yes, we could only know what God wants for us in our sanctification or in our thanksgiving in the, in the middle of all sorts of God-given and, yes, even difficult circumstances. This is a prayer, as he says, that we might be filled with the knowledge of his will. This is talking about something that starts with the scriptures, which alone can bear fruit in and of their own accord and can increase and grow. And that's the only way by which we could, in some sort of objective sense, know God's will. And this is a prayer that what's revealed about God's will in his word would start to permeate everything about us. Paul's praying that the Colossians could be permeated, filled up, all of their faculties overcome with the thoughts about God's will, the implications of God's will, the application of God's will, and the desire to carry it out in our lives. This is what it means to be filled up with God's will and knowledge of it. This is a prayer to experience the benefit of knowing and submitting to God's will in every aspect of life. P.T. O'Brien said it this way. He said, Paul's actual petition is for the discernment of God's will and the power to perform it. And that's exactly right. Now, let, me, let me give you a, a, an Old Testament parallel to this prayer of Paul. Uh, turn real quickly to, to Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2 is um, a favorite of mine because we... I mean, and, and trust me, if, you're, if you were getting nervous there at that introduction, and you're thinking, it sounds like John's trying to say that the prayer in Colossians 1 means we shouldn't be praying for a knowledge of God's will. Don't be nervous. That's not, that's not at all what, what I'm saying. Of course, when you are in trial and when you lack wisdom, you must go to God in faith and ask for wisdom. The, the, the difference, of course, is what's the nature of wisdom versus the simple knowledge. And here's exactly what happens in the, on the pen of Solomon, chapter 2, Proverbs 2, look at verses 1 through uh, 6. Proverbs 2, 1 to 6. My son, if you, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, pause, you can't even get past the first verse without realizing objectively it starts with Scripture. To know God's will, it starts with God's revelation. But knowing the truth of Scripture is not enough. We're talking about being filled, in Paul's words, filled with the knowledge of God's will. And this is kind of Solomon's version of that. Verse 2, 
make your ear attentive to wisdom. Incline your heart to understanding. The, the picture here is your ear is attentive. It's, it's not just, yeah, I've heard that before, I recognize it as familiar. It's attentive to wisdom. It's attentive to what God says. It says it's, a, it's an ear that's quick to say, I've I got to hear that again. I've got to hear it better. I've got to hear it more. I want to be a careful listener. The second line, incline your heart, kind of means to bend. So your heart is the core of your, of your being. Your heart is the command center of who you are. As a man thinks within himself, so is he. That's the sum and substance of who you are. It's your heart, your inner man. Your inner man should bend, incline toward God's commands. Not just knowing what they are. <laughs> to incline toward a command means you actually do what he says. So already Solomon's gotten two verses in, and we know we're starting with the Scripture. And number two, if we're going to have discernment and wisdom in the Scripture, it requires us to have an inner man that is bending towards obedience. I long to obey everything that I see from my Lord. Verse 3, for if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. I mean, here is the expression of someone who has access to the sufficient scriptures. They are sufficient in and of themselves to know and have a knowledge of God's will. But the desperate sinner looks at that sufficient revelation and says, but Lord, here's the problem. I need discernment in this revelation. I need to be filled up with implications of what's happening in your word. i got to be able to trace it out and think about what does this look like in my circumstance. I, I'm desperate for you to help me. And then you actually cry to the Lord. You're saying, Lord, give me understanding. I need supernatural assistance. Even with a sufficient revelation of what you want from me, flesh it out in my life. Fill me up so that all my faculties are consumed with your will. Verse 4 says, If you seek her as silver and search for her as hit for hidden treasures, and, and you can just write in your margin there, uh, Job 28. You know, Job talks about the value of wisdom. And, uh, you know, human, humans, we'll, we'll dig deep into the earth. We'll, we'll, go a, we'll go a mile down just to find a vein of perishable precious metal and the wisdom of god is infinitely more valuable than that and if we were to put forth the kind of effort that we would go to to hit a, a vein of gold underground if we put forth that kind of effort what happens verse five if you put that kind of effort into search into getting the knowledge of god to understand his word and his will then verse five says you will discern the fear of the Lord, and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And I love Proverbs 2 because it brings into perfect balance, of course, obviously it's perfect balance. It brings into perfect balance in this discussion of knowing God's will in an objective sense and being filled with it in a sense of understanding. Both come from the Lord. It starts with the scripture, and then as we come to the Lord and we're crying out for insight, discernment, for our faculties to be permeated with this, with this will, then we actually discern what it means to fear the Lord. We can actually scrutinize our life and be able to look at our life and say, yeah, this, this, is, this is exactly God's will, is this path, because he, he's brought it to bear, and I, I can see the connections, and, and, and my, my heart bends toward this, my, my will inclines toward this. See, part of the problem with knowing God's will is not that we have an insufficient revelation. We have a sufficient revelation. Part of the problem with knowing God's will is that times we can actually find ourselves studying God's sufficient revelation without a heart that inclines toward carrying it out. If you find yourself studying the infallible access to the heart and mind of our God without a heart that inclines toward carrying it out, then we won't discern God's will for our lives. Because we could be looking straight down a path as clear as this aisle in the center of this sanctuary. I can see a clear path to the door. But if my heart has no desire to, to get down that path, 
I'm going to miss it all day long. And so we come to the Lord with our hearts, uh, recognizing that our hearts are, are, are flawed and are fallible, and they're going to mess it up. And so we're, we're praying on the foundation of the Scripture that bears fruit in and of itself. Lord, if we are going to bear fruit, we need your, your Word, and we need insight into your Word, and I need understanding, and I need a heart that bends that direction. And that's what I believe Paul is alluding to when he says, I'm praying that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. And get this, at the end of verse 9, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. In all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So this is the kind of wisdom and understanding that Solomon was exhorting his sons to pursue, and this is the same kind of wisdom and understanding that Paul is praying for the Colossians, and this is the same knowledge and understanding that we need. Is that when all spiritual wisdom and understanding in verse 9. What's that produce? Verse 10, the result of that is so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord um, to please him in all respects. And this really is God's will in this prayer. If you want to know, okay, so just boil it down. What is God's will in some sort of objective sense? Here's your, here's your phrase. God wants us to please him in every aspect of life. God wants us to please him in every aspect of life. That's just simply God's will. In this prayer, it's just as simple as everything about you, everything in your life, he wants all of it to please him. We can do no better than that. Every aspect of our life should please him. And when he says to walk worthy of the Lord, the word worthy um, uh, has, a, has a, a connotation, you know, and th it's not that this word always means this word picture. It's just here's a word picture that's often corollary to this word worthy. Um, it's often used in contexts where you would have like a scale, and then on a scale you'd have the, the, the arms hanging out, and then you could, you know, equalize something. You can put a, a weight over here, and then you can weigh out grain, you know, like a merchant would weigh it, and, you know, it's, it's equal, it's, it's worthy, it's corollary. So you'd have a one pound weight and, you know, one pound of grain, so on and so forth. So the picture here that it might be helpful to even imagine is to walk worthy of the Lord. The, the, the idea here is that God's will for us is that if you put the Lord's worth, what's he worth, what's he worthy of on one side of the scale, and you put your life on the other side of the scale, they should balance. That's a tall order. <laughs> you think about what, the, what our Lord is worthy of the kind of worship that he so richly deserves. And the heart of his children should be saying, man, I really want my life. I don't, I don't want that to just go, <laughs> that life wasn't worth anything. I want it to, to balance. I want my life, my conduct, I want every aspect of my life to be worthy of the Lord. He's deserving of that. Well, that is God's will. Let me just say, we're going to move pretty quickly here because we, we have few remaining minutes. And in these last few minutes, I want to look at what's going to be produced in our life when this prayer is answered. What Paul does is he gives it to us in four participles. Okay, you think, uh-oh, another grammar lesson. Well, I listed them out for you, and this hopefully can be, hopefully you can see it right off the page here. Number one, look at the word bearing fruit. Number two, look at the word increasing, and because the issue is increasing in the knowledge of God, I titled that learning him. So number one, bearing fruit. Number two, learning him. Number three, look at verse 11. I titled this being strong. The, the, the word there in the NES is strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Strengthened. And so the result of knowing God's will and being able to walk worthy is that we'll be supernaturally strengthened. But being strong is the simple way to put it. And then number four, basically the last word in the NES of verse 11 and then all of verse 12 is the fourth participle, giving thanks. Giving thanks. God wants us to please him in every aspect of life. And believer, when you are filled 
with a knowledge of his will, when a knowledge of God's will permeates every faculty, when you're filled with all spiritual wisdom and insight, and you will be enabled to please the Lord in all aspects, the result of that kind of life will be this. You'll bear fruit, you're going to be learning God, you're going to be uh, strengthened, you're going to be giving thanks. That's exactly what a life looks like that is permeated with a knowledge of God's will and is carrying that out in a, in, a, in a worthwhile way. Of course, not perfectly, but that will be certainly the direction of your life. So let's look at these uh, one at a time. Number one, bearing fruit in 10b. Bearing fruit in every good work. The result of knowing God's will is never a fear or an aversion to good works. I almost feel like I have to, you know, just re- let it come off the page, but it seems so shocking in, in some circles and some, especially some you know, almost like a hyper-reform circles today, it's almost like because we're not justified by works, talking about good works is almost a heresy. And Paul's sitting there saying, I'm praying that you'd be fully saturated in knowledge of God's will so that you actually would bear good fruit and you actually would produce good fruit in all your works. Of course, the issue is it's a tragedy to trust in your works. But the response to, if, if trusting in your works is a, is a heresy, the, 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 the antidote is don't trust in them. Not don't do them. The issue is not trusting in them, not, not, not doing them. So Paul says, look, if your faculties are filled with the knowledge of God's will, you'll, your life will actually walk worthy of the Lord. What you're going to see is a life full of fruit. You will be bearing fruit. Let me show you a couple examples of this. Um, look at Matthew for a second. Let's go back to the Sermon on the Mount. I want, to see, I want you to see Jesus' words. I know these are familiar to you, but it would be a good reminder. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. Jesus is, is really properly launching into the body of this sermon. The Beatitudes are kind of the introduction. The Beatitudes really being um, a description of kingdom citizenship. The kingdom is future, but the citizens are present. And he describes who those kingdom citizens are. And that's verses 1 through 12. In verse 13, he says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? And again, just to make it clear, I know this this verse sometimes gets taken and and hijacked by by some in the transformationalist circles who make it an issue of preserving the culture as if the Christianity is to make uh, culture, to make this, this, uh, this world a better place. That's not, not even in view here. The, the view here is not the, preser, the preserving power of salt as if you were talking about salting meat. The, the issue is flavor. Christians should taste radically different than the world. They should have a very distinct flavor. So if salt loses its flavor, then how can it be made salty again? It's not good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You should shine like lights in contrast to darkness. You should taste like salt in contrast to bland fluid of the world. No one does, uh, take, takes a light and, and puts it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The issue here is that our good deeds should be so distinct that they should see this is produced by God. The desire to make this world a better place is something common to all citizens, self-loving, idolatrous, and Christians. But what's unique to a Christian is fruit that is supernaturally empowered, unable to be mimicked by mere mortals, produced by God through them. That's the kind of life that we should be living so that people see that and say, man, those are good works that I, no self-loving person can replicate. That's the kind of fruit that comes to somebody whose, whose faculties are permeated with a knowledge of God's will. Uh, you don't turn there, but Jesus also talks about the importance of bearing fruit because you'll prove to be his disciples in John 15. You, you want to write that down. Just write down John 15, 1 through 11. John 15, 1 to 11, because Jesus has so much to say about the importance of bearing fruit, namely obedience, obeying God's commands, and fullness of joy, even in the midst of suffering. And, and that's the fruit that, that the Lord is interested in. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, talks about your, your deeds being seen so that uh, others can glorify God on the day of his visitation. That's a sweet parallel to the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. 
But clearly, fruit bearing is far from being a problem. It's a necessary result of knowing God's will. And God wants us to bear fruit. He's pleased by it. He's glorified by it. We are actually better for it. And it's just incredible to think of how kind the Lord is to produce fruit through us when we have a discernment in God's will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Number two, learning him. I almost said knowing him because verse 10c says knowledge of God. The challenge I had with that is knowing God is just, it just doesn't quite capture the participle, which is increasing. And so there's an increasing in the knowledge of God, so that's why I said learning him. Um, you know, the Bible talks about no, an unbeliever's knowledge of God in a couple of ways. Romans 1 talks about the fact that all men know God. All men have a knowledge of God naturally. It's evident within them. There's no, every atheist is a, is, an, is a liar because every human being is created in the image of God. We all have experienced general revelation, and we all have a conscience. And so in Romans 1 and 2, you can document that. There's no such thing as somebody who is ignorant of God in that sense that they all know, we all know, he has divine power and eternal nature. However, the scriptures also talk about a sense where there is a knowledge of God that, that no man has naturally. And we saw that in 1 Thessalonians 4, 5. He says, don't be like the Gentiles who do not know God. So they know that there's an eternal being who has divine power and eternal nature, but they don't know God in a relational sense. And so you're never more like a professing atheist, according to 1 Thess 4, 5, than when you are immoral. And those are the two ways that the Bible talks about an unbeliever and his knowledge of God. Only a believer knows God and has a relationship with him, and we only know who God is from his word. And so, you know, when, when you talk to family or friends who, who question that, a good question to just kind of, remind yourself of, or even ask them if you have a good relationship with them, is just say, hey, what, what's your favorite thing about God that you didn't learn from his word? <laughs> it's like, it's all we, know, all we know about God is what he's told us about himself. And um, he's told us everything we need to know about him, but what Paul is praying for is an increase in the knowledge of God, that we would be continually learning him. And what's sweet about this prayer is like you could think about it this way. Let's say that you had the mind of, let's say you had the, the memorizing capability of a first century rabbi like Paul who had a tremendous ability to memorize the scripture and then was in, filled with the Holy Spirit at his conversion. Paul would still be praying for himself increase, an increase in the knowledge of God. He wants to know God more. And he's talking about an experiential knowledge of God where there's so much more about God to be learned, not only from his word, but by yielding and by submitting. And let me show you an example of this in Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5 is a great example of this because it actually says that our Lord learned obedience. And this is profound, what, what it says about Christ. In chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 10 Talking of Jesus Christ, it says in verse 7, In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him. And then it says, the NAS has from death. Uh, I, think the, I think the column, yeah, the mar if you're reading the NAS, the margin is much better, out of death. <laughs> Obviously, um, you know, it's, the issue's not their ability, but he, he, God could have saved could God have saved Christ from actually dying? I mean, what, what's, he, what's he praying for here? He's crying to the Lord who is able to save him out of death. He's not praying to save him from getting there. He's praying, God, save me out of death, because he knows he's going there. And he was heard. Obviously, if he was, if he was praying <laughs> to be saved from death, he wasn't heard. He was praying, save me out of death. He was heard, why? Because of his piety. He was heard because of his godliness. Verse 8, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Now, that should not confuse any of us that as if the author of Hebrews is saying something heretical, like, oh, he actually got to this point of where he, he finally started obeying, 
And I guess that's what he means in verse 9 when he says, having been made perfect. I guess, did he go from imperfection to perfection? No, not at all. Uh, that word perfect doesn't have that connotation in the, in, in so much in the original. It has more of the, in, uh, the connotation of being brought to fruition. He's brought to the end of his life. He's brought to the whole goal of practical obedience and submission to God's will because he had to learn obedience in the process of suffering. He's actually learning more by yielding himself to the will of his father. He's not becoming perfect as if he had lacked perfection. All that was missing was the actual carrying out of practical righteousness with the cost involved of his own personal death. And he did not shrink back from obedience, and he learned obedience, though he knew his father perfectly. Profound. It's just profound. So look at this prayer in Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. He's praying, Colossians, I want you to increase in the knowledge of God. When your faculties are filled up and consumed with the knowledge of his will, you know what's going to produce in your life? An increasing knowledge of God. You will be learning God. It's one thing to say, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he is faithful. It's another thing to yield yourself to his revealed will and on the backside of suffering and cost and consequence to be able to look with the eyes of faith and say, wow, God is so faithful. It's not that it was less true before, but in a sense, you learned God. And that's what Paul's praying for the Colossians. Paul even said that himself in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. He says that I could know God and share in the affliction of his sufferings. Um, he obviously knew God. He was saved when he wrote it, but he was praying for something more, namely the knowledge of God that's in practice, experiencing what God ha what has for us and um, continuing to walk in his will. Last two, let's look at verse 11. Being strong, being strong. Verse 11 says, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. And I think the semicolon there is correct, joyously going with verse 12. So we'll just leave it right there at that semicolon. Believer, praise God for putting us in circumstances that require something beyond human strength. Otherwise, we would never sense our need for this prayer. We need supernatural strength. It says, strengthened with all power. All my power? <laughs> all what power? All of his power. Because it says, according to his glorious might. So being strong is certainly going to be the result of the answer to this prayer request. We will be strengthened. Maybe it would be more accurate. In fact, I had it this way. It just got a little bit long being supernaturally strengthened. Strengthened beyond what you could possibly find in and of yourself. I mean, if your Christianity, if, if all that was required for endurance in your Christianity was something that you have the potential for, you would never need this prayer, and you could also deceive yourself. And what you need is an endurance that is outside of you, beyond your ability, supernaturally enabled. Consider this hypothetical. What if, what if the Christian life were, were nothing more than acting on the most attractive desires as discerned by our own fallen will? First, of course, this would obviously be unquestionably miserable for us. We'd just be living out our lives according to our fallen will, and our lives would not glorify God as it ought. But secondly, and more importantly, the glory of our perseverance would go to us. And it's kind of like the testing of our faith in 1 Peter. If, if you want to know if your, your faith is real, you have to be tested in your faith beyond what, you're, what, you, what, what you could do on your own. It has to be proven to a point that it requires supernatural power of divine given, divinely given faith to be tested at that level. And the same is true here when it comes to steadfastness or endurance and patience, um, literally slow to anger slow to, or more literally, long to anger. It takes you a long time to get, get angry. That's what the word patience is. Steadfastness means to remain under. It's an endurance type of word. 
for us to attain that, we need supernatural assistance. And so praise God, he puts us in circumstances that we could not persevere in on our own strength. When we have that kind of endurance and steadfastness and patience, then we can thank the Lord for what he's producing in us. God wants us to please him in every aspect of life. Number one, bearing fruit. Number two, learning him. Number three, being strong. And now finally, number four, giving thanks. Add that last word from verse 11, and then we'll read verse 12. Joyously giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Okay, what's God's will for your life? Your thanksgiving, right? We saw that in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In all things, give thanks. In every aspect of life, give thanks. In every circumstance, give thanks. That's just First Thess 5, 18. How about if we add Ephesians 5, 20 to that equation? And I, I, like, I like taking First Thess 5, 18 and putting 5, 20, Ephesians 5, 20 together because Paul says to the Th Thessalonians, in everything, give thanks. And he says to the Ephesians, for everything, give thanks. And how sweet is that? tandem. It's not just enough to say, okay, in this circumstance, I'll give thanks. But not for it. I am not thankful for these circumstances. So help me, I am not going to express gratitude. Clench teeth. Paul says, for those circumstances, thank God for them, for everything. I mean, you could not possibly put yourself in some of the circumstances that you and this congregation have been in and found yourself giving thanks to God if you had not been filled to some degree with the knowledge of his will, knowing this is what God wants, knowing he doesn't make mistakes, no increasing in his character, knowing he put me here, and this is perfect, and it's unimprovable providence, and it, and I can't even question why he put me here. I might not know the answers yet. And I might not know the answers even this side of heaven. But I know he knows, and I trust him, and that's enough for me. And you find yourself giving thanks for circumstances that are undesirable. That is God's will. That's the mark, and that's the result of a mind and a heart that have been filled with the knowledge of God's will. It's the result of a life that has been enabled to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and please Him in all respects. And regardless of what God's doing, it's enough simply that God is pleased by my giving thanks for these circumstances. Is that enough for us? To just put a smile on God's face because we could say, you've done no wrong, Lord. Thank you. And we could never see any of these four, starting in 10b, all the way through verse 12. None of these four participles could ever be true in our life without the answer to this prayer that he begins in verses 9 through 10a. So we're going to close, and as we close, I just want to pray this prayer for us. Father, for this reason also, since the day we've heard of it, we, we've not ceased, we, we want to pray right now and pray that we would not cease praying this prayer that we would pray for one another in this body and ask that we might be filled with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we would walk in a manner worthy of you, to please you in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of you, being strengthened with all power according to your glorious might so that we would attain all steadfastness and patience joyously giving thanks to you because you who are the, you're the one who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And Lord, as we do make this prayer, our prayer this morning, we, we pray it with such incredible confidence because we, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt this is a prayer that's in line with your will because it's an inspired prayer from an apostle to saints. And so this is a prayer that you can't help but answer. Lord, our prayer is not that we would avoid difficulty or that we would be able to see the kind of fruit we want to see 
Our prayer is that we'd be filled with the knowledge of your will so that you'd be pleased with every single aspect of our life. That's our desire, Lord. And so thank you for the guarantee that if we pray this in line with your name and in line with your character, this is your desire, it's your will, um, we've already received the answer. And so we dare not ask without faith, unless we be a double-minded man. We know that you love to answer this prayer so that we could actually carry it out and that the lives of, of the saints here at GBC would really weigh equal on the scale to what you deserve. We, we long to give you a life that's, that's worthy of your name. Of course, we, we have no ability to do that. That's why we're praying. That's why we come to you. And so thank you for uh, the promises of your word to, to answer prayer. And thank you for a revelation of your will in your word. So now fill us with it, we pray. Amen.